Noon. Good to see you. Uh, I'm David Axelrod. I'm the founder and director of the Institute of Politics, and we are really pleased to welcome you today. And Governor, we're so happy to have you uh, welcome you back to campus. You spent how many years here? Uh, I actually spent. Oh, that's a good question. Well, six going to school here, plus one in between, just kind of hang around. Okay, we'll count that as seven. Yeah. Um, and you know, we're also happy to hear, have you here because we are, as you know, the university is very committed to bring a diversity of views, uh, having good uh, civil discourse. You and I probably disagree on some things, and we My agree. My wife and I too. And we agree on other things like the Cubs. Right. <laughs> so uh, it's it's great to see you. Uh, and um, I wanted to just note before I introduce our introducer. Uh, that this is the final event of the uh, academic year, speaker series event, and it's been an absolutely wonderful year. Uh, we've had a, a, lot, a lot of people, politicians, office holders, journalists, activists, uh, and uh, really, really rich conversations, and they've been enriched by all of you who have come to our events and contributed your thoughts and ideas. So. We're, we're really excited about the year and really looking forward already uh, to next year and seeing you all back in the fall. Uh, now, just a few housekeeping notes. Um, after today's moderated discussion with Jeff Zeleny from CNN, a native Nebraskan, mm -hmm. uh, so he's fully qualified for this discussion, uh, we will take questions from the floor. Uh, please line up behind the microphone. Uh, we're going to as always, uh, prioritize questions from students. Uh, and uh, as always, please make sure that your questions actually end in a question mark. Uh, and as a housekeeping note, uh, can you please make sure that your phones are on silent? And now we will hear a, a formal introduction from Declan Hurley, a second year in the college studying economics and history. Declan owns a rare coin business, entrepreneur, huh? and is uh, vice president of the Chicago Thinker, a nationally recognized campus conservative publication. He's also active in Calvert House, the campus Catholic students group. Uh, Declan. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for attending today's event with Nebraska Governor Pete Ricketts. I'm Declan Hurley. My hometown is Charlotte, North Carolina and I'm a second year undergraduate majoring in economics and history. Governor Ricketts, our guest today, was born August 19, 1964 in Nebraska City. He spent his college years in the same classrooms as us, graduating from UChicago Chicago in 1986, and he received his MBA from MB, uh, Booth Business School in 1991. Ricketts started his career in the business sector, serving as president and chief operating officer of financial services company Ameritrade prior to being elected governor of Nebraska in 2014 and re-elected in 2018. A defining theme of Ricketts' governorship has been his application of business acumen to state government. He has limited state spending, cut taxes, and laid waste to right tape. Governor Ricketts has also pushed for checks and balances in Nebraska state government, which is unique in that it has a powerful unicameral state legislature, and Ricketts views states as the bedrock of American policymaking and as a testing ground for innovative solutions. Perhaps the busiest man in America, Ricketts is also the co-owner of the Chicago Cubs, a committed Catholic, and a member of the Knights of Columbus. Our moderator today is Jeff Cellini, who grew up in Exeter, Nebraska, population 591 by the 2010 census, and attended the University of Nebraska. He's worked for several major publications, including the New York Times, and is currently CNN's uh, chief national affairs correspondent. This afternoon, Governor Ricketts and Mr. Cellini will consider the governor's record, whether bipartisanship matters, and a two-century-old tension between state rights and federal power. The governor will draw from his seven years of experience leading a state of two million people, and Mr. Zellini from his nearly 30 years as a journalist. It is my great honor to introduce Governor Ricketts and Jeff Zellini. Thank you. Declan, thank you. And Governor, it's good to be uh, on stage with you. You as well. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. I see that you have the red tie. I did not get the, uh, 
the Nebraska memo. But, well, come uh, on. yeah, we'll come on, go Big Red. You I said know, the first thing you said when I walked in was go Big Red. For sure, for sure. <laughs> I want to ask you about your uh, rugby days here on campus later, but uh, um, I do want to start. You were the uh, co-chair of the Republican Governors Association, obviously, so yeah. you have a window into uh, states' rights versus federalism, but I think we have to start with what's on the country's mind right now, obviously the shooting in Texas. Um, you uh, signed an order uh, lowering flags to half staff in Nebraska, as well as other states, and you sent out a tweet uh, saying that it was pure evil. Um, what can be done by policymakers to prevent these massacres from happening? Yeah, so, of course, our, our prayers go to all the families who are suffering right now. And we have a lot of investigation to do on this particular shooting and the one in Buffalo as well. Stanford did a study of these shooters, and their study says that these shooters have mental health issues, which doesn't shock any of us. And one of the things we've done in Nebraska is try to improve our mental health care, which is something that is a problem across the country. I mean, this is not something that is a Nebraska problem or any state's particular problem. To start with, there just aren't enough mental health care professionals. And we need to get more into that field. We're actually, we actually, in this last legislative session, um, set aside another $5 million to be able to do more to recruit people into behavioral health in the nursing fields through loan forgiveness and other incentives like that. Uh, one of the things we've done previously as well is established our system of care. We actually got a, a SAMHSA grant uh, back in 2018 for $9 million. And the system of care is really to improve our mental health system in Nebraska uh, really focusing on children, especially, to be able to make sure we're getting resources to parents and those children, try and keep them in classrooms, try to avoid really intrusive out or inpatient type surgery, you know, make it outpatient, that sort of thing. Uh, provide um, kind of triage via phone, now we can do it via Zoom, for families who are too far to get to a clinic, that sort of thing. And I think the other thing too, and I, I really, I think about analyze, uh, making the analogy with sex trafficking and human trafficking, that it requires a lot more education and training for mental health care professionals, for educators, for law enforcement, and the general public. One of the things that we want to do is be preventative, and that's what we've really focused on in Nebraska, trying to do a better job of opening up lines of communications, you know, pointing together groups of educators and um, health care professionals and um, you know, mental health care professionals and law enforcement. So there's good lines of communication to try to be able to be preventative, to find people who are going to be prone to do this and get them help before they do something like this. And that's one of the things we need help on. This is why I analogize it to human trafficking because we all can be involved in the fight against human trafficking by looking for those signs, right? The person who doesn't have control of their phone or their ID uh, we train, for example, in, in Nebraska, we train emergency room professionals to look for certain signs. Frankly, there's types of tattoos that are kind of dead giveaways, but other things as well. And we've been able to rescue women from human trafficking by doing that. But that involves the public being involved. Uh, we, we post it, for example, on all our rest stops. We post the 800 number that everybody can call, that sort of thing. We need a similar type, uh, type effort around this effort as well to be able to look for those signs of somebody. Um, every, well, Every May I proclaim it Mental Health Awareness Month to be able to help raise more awareness about mental health issues and to get people just to start with, check in with your friends and family and neighbors, ask them how they're doing. Look for those signs of you know, someone who maybe is hypervigilant or is depressed or isolated or, or whatever, is not acting the way they normally act as a start. And that's just true for all mental health, not just involved when we're talking about shootings. So those are some of the things that we need to really do more to engage the public, mental health care professionals, educators, law enforcement, to be more preventive on this, just like we need it for the human trafficking, to be able to engage, to look for how do we stop this before these types of things happen. How about on guns? Anything that the state or federal government should do on these uh, type of weapons that are used in virtually all of these shootings? I don't think there's... So anything that we can do with regard to somebody who is going to do this, we got to get to the root cause. The gun is just a tool. We got to get to the root cause, which is the mental health. I don't believe in depriving people of their Second Amendment rights who are law-abiding citizens. And that's part of the challenge here is, again, getting to the people who need the help, get them the help, get to the root cause, and not focused on the gun. 
Uh, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell uh, said today that uh, he has uh, authorized or allowed Senator John Cornyn from Texas to begin discussing um, some types of actions of expanding universal background checks and see if the Congress can do anything. Uh, do you believe that there's any congressional action that is justified in this, or is this an example of states' rights versus federalism, and uh, there is no role for Congress to play? And if so, how do you explain that to the Well, we, we already have a role for Congress, right? We already do get background checks. When you go to a gun store, right, or, you know, any sporting goods store, and you want to buy a gun, you have to go through a background check. And we actually already have laws that prevent you that if, if you've got mental health issues, you can't buy that gun, right? And we do have restrictions on you got to be certain, you know, you got to be 18 years old to, to buy a long gun, I think 21 to buy a handgun. Maybe that's a Nebraska law, maybe that's Should it be 21 to buy a long gun? Uh, I would let the states regulate that, not make it a federal thing. But we do have examples like, for example, a national beta database is appropriate from the standpoint of, you know, we want to make sure somebody isn't crossing state lines if they're, from, you know, forbidden in one state to be able to, you know, get around that. So I think those kind of things, if they're going to be looking at improvements on that, I'm always open on ideas on how we can improve systems to be preventative for people who should not have guns, whether it's because you've got mental health problems or a felon or whatever it is. There, there may be ways to improve that, and I'm open to those ideas. But again, we have to be conscious of the fact this is in our Constitution, right? This is in the Bill of Rights, the Second Amendment right. And we've got to be, that means that to me, it means that there's a higher le level of care that we have to do when we're looking at restricting those rights. Again, just like the First Amendment, we don't allow people to go into a theater and yell fire, right? We do obviously have some restrictions on it, but it ha I think it's a higher standard of examination when you are talking about one of those rights that is specifically written in the Constitution. You're a Catholic and you often talk about how your faith has driven your uh, policy views on things. Why should gun control not be a pro-life issue? Well, I actually think that, again, protecting people's rights is part of a pro-life issue. Like, and the Second Amendment is very clear that we have the right to keep and bear arms. And so I think that actually fits into exactly what we think about is protecting our rights. And remember, why did, the, why did the founders put that in our Constitution? They put that in there to protect our rights, protect the other rights as well. That's one of the reasons, you know, our founders believe that governments tend toward tyranny and that those rights come to us from God. It was a pretty radical idea at the time, right? Previously, most people thought that rights came to the sovereign, usually a king, and the king then divvied those rights out to the people. But our founders said, no, our rights are ours. They come to us directly from God. We established governments to protect those rights, and one of those things we're going to establish to protect our rights is the Second Amendment. So I think it actually just all goes back to our rights come from God. The Second Amendment is there to help protect our rights. Do you understand how some people may not find uh, the words that you say or other uh, political figures say at this moment adequate because these shootings still keep happening? Um, is there something more that needs to be done? You talked about mental health, but I mean, do you understand how words simply you know, may not be adequate? Well, certainly when you're talking about tragic events like this, there are no words to make the families feel better, right? right? They've lost a little child. There's just no getting beyond that. Obviously, one of the things that uh, you have your eye on and governors across the country have their eye on is the, uh, the, uh, the uh, Supreme Court uh, pending opinion on Roe versus Wade. If it has, are you just going to uh, jump right into it, right, Jeff? You're right like, oh, we're not going. We're going to start with guns, right. and then we're going to abortion. <laughs> Perfect. And Donald Trump comes next, <laughs> so get Trump ready for that. that. Um, All right, we got a good trifecta. No, just news up. of the day here, but as you know, um, uh, the legislature in Nebraska, which is unicameral, uh, which is the only you're familiar with as well. The only uh, for those who don't know is just uh, one chamber, and every bill gets a public hearing. Um, it's so unique. It's, we're the only state that has it. It's Guam has it too, by the way. It's technically. Uh, Nonpartisan, non but yeah. we'll ask you about that in a second if that's actually true. But back to abortion, just one quick thing. If the Supreme Court rules uh, to overturn a Roe v. Wade, as governor, will you reconvene a, a legislative session um, as you've talked about previously? Or, or what yeah, I'll thinking? work with our Speaker of the Legislature to, to see what else we can do to protect those preborn babies. And is it, your, is it that's still your view that there should be no exceptions for a rape or incest? Well, as I said on CNN before to one of your colleagues, they're babies too. And do you think that it will have a different outcome? Or, I mean, that was rejected in April by the legislature, so. You mean the bill that we had mm -hmm. in April, yeah. yeah. Or is there uh, a different thing you're looking at? Or? Well, again, it gets back to what will we be able to get passed? Right. How can we do more to protect those preborn babies? That's if Roe versus Wade is overturned. That is what I will work with the, the Speaker of the Legislature on. What more can we do?
So since we are here at the Institute of Politics, it would be, uh, we'd be a remiss not to talk about the midterm election season. Uh, Nebraska does not always have many competitive races that are watched across the country, but you've been a part of several yourself, running it's often in the primaries. But boy, this year was a doozy. And your candidate... Yeah, made everybody forget about my primary election eight right. years ago. Exactly. <laughs> um, but let's start, at the, let's start at the beginning of this. Uh, you sure. supported uh, the Republican nominee, uh, Jim Pillen, who's on the Board of Regents at the University of Nebraska. But all the way back last year, you had a phone call, I'm told, with uh, the former president asking him to not get involved in the race. He didn't take you up on that. But take us into that, that call and that conversation, if you could. Well, it was a private conversation, so I'm not going to take you into the details. I'll, I'll leave it at what you've described. It was... I, call him, I called the president and asked him not to get involved in our primary race, and he decided to do otherwise. What was your rationale at the time, or what, what was your... Uh, I was trying to get Jim Pillen to win. <laughs> right. Right. I knew that if the president endorsed another candidate, that that would make it more difficult. So these last several months have been very interesting, obviously. You became very involved in the primary. You got behind a candidate, and you actively tried to um, stop... Uh, Trump's candidate, Charles Herbster, from winning. Was there any point during this time, like when the president came in for a rally, that you wondered if your candidate was going to, uh, to be successful? Well, in any race, you never take it for granted. You always know that there's the risk that you're going to lose. So there's never, it's never a sure thing at any time. And you just do the best you can to help your candidate out. And that's what, we, that's what I tried to do. Why did you become so uh, passionate in trying to stop Charles Herbster? Well, I was supporting Jim Pillen. When I'm in, I'm in. I'm, right. I'm going to help him. I'm not going to do it halfway. And not only do I think Jim was the right candidate, I think he's a great man. He's got great values. He was, you know, he took his, really, his tenant, his family's tenant farm and grew it up into one of the largest pork operations in the country. Uh, you know, very humble beginnings and very successful, created a thousand Nebraska jobs, obviously public service in mind because he was on the border regions, uh, veterinarian, so a smart man. You know, so you, and just based in agriculture, which is our number one industry in Nebraska. So just a lot of reasons why Jim was the right person for the job. And frankly, Charles Herbster was a flawed candidate on many levels. Built his business uh, in Missouri, didn't want to pay his property taxes on time. In fact, failed to pay his property taxes 500 times. And then when asked about it, tried to, uh, well, first of all, he was asked about, well, why didn't you put your business in Nebraska? And he said, well, I didn't know I wanted to be governor 14 years ago. By the way, that's a terrible answer. Um, <laughs> And then when asked about why he didn't pay his property taxes on time, he said, well, I wanted to make sure my vendors and my people got paid. Mm -hmm. But in the same year that he didn't pay his home county, Richardson County, $36,000 in taxes, he gave a gubernatorial candidate $2 million. It's like, Charles, you got the money. Pay your taxes. Just own it. So rather than trying to do the whole, well, it's not my fault, this is a noble thing, it's like, dude, you got the money. Just pay your taxes. Like he, did, he just was typically not trying to own the things that he should have owned. And then, of course, there were uh, late in the race came up the, uh, the allegations from eight women, two of which came forward with their names of sexual misconduct, okay. uh, which also is disqualifying for somebody to be in public office. So pulling the lens back a little bit at the end of May, what have we learned about uh, the former president's influence in the Republican Party, both in Nebraska and in other states? Well, I think one of the things that we always got to take a step back and think about is endorsements can help, but they only go so far in general. And any time you're going to have a contested Republican primary, by definition, it means you're going to have Republicans backing different candidates. And that's the case in Nebraska. It's the case I supported Brian Kemp in Georgia. But I, President Trump endorsed Greg Abbott in Texas and Kevin Stitt in Oklahoma, and I support those two candidates. So it doesn't mean just because you're backing different candidates in one race, you're not going to back the same candidate someplace else. And, I, you know, I support many of President Trump's policies when he was president. So I don't know that it says a big thing here other than that ultimately the people of the state are going to make the decision based upon who the candidate is and what they represent. Um, you know, we can talk about Brian Kemp. He's got a great record in Georgia. And the people of Georgia rewarded him pretty tremendously on Tuesday when his opponent was only kind of re trying to relitigate the 2020 election. In Nebraska, it was kind of the same thing. Jim Pillen laid out a plan for what he was going to do for Nebraska, and Charles Herbster kind of ran on being Trump-endorsed and didn't really have a plan. In fact, didn't even really campaign that much until March. So maybe one thing we've learned, it's not only enough just to be Trump-endorsed. You have to have, have more than that. And you were in yeah. Georgia um, over the weekend at campaigning. Chris Christie came in. Some other governors came in. 
That was a clear that. repudiation. Uh, it was a landslide, 52 point uh, victory for Brian Kemp. That specifically, as well as the Secretary of State's race there, seems uh, to the voters I talked to, I was down there for a while as well, that Republicans are looking forward. They're not looking in the rearview mirror of 2020. Is that your sense? And do you believe that that's critical for the future of your party? Well, I think it's true of all voters all time. I don't think that's changed. I think voters are always looking forward. And I will tell you, especially in gubernatorial races, and I'm biased because I'm a governor, right, okay? Yeah, that, take it for what, is, what I'm saying. I think maybe when you're talking about Senate and Congress, maybe you get more into the type of uh, hot button issues that maybe drive voters a little bit more because it's a little bit farther away, right? Washington, D.C. is far away. Maybe the, the issues themselves are a little bit more theoretical. But when you're talking about governors, governors impact people's lives, right? Their, their children, their family, their communities. And certainly during this last pandemic, we have seen how important governors are, right? How much influence a governor can have on outcomes in a state. So I think that voters are smart and they recognize that governors have a bigger influence on their day-to-day -day lives than necessarily somebody who's gonna be in Washington, D.C., who's one of 435 or even one of 100. And so they care more about what's going on in the state and wanna reward performance. Governors are held accountable for results. And they want to reward people who are doing the right thing. So during your almost eight years as governor now, you've uh, served under three presidents, or at the same time as three presidents, a Democratic administration in Obama, the Trump administration, and the beginning of the Biden administration. Are there any similarities, uh, or walk us through the similarities and the differences uh, between administrations as they re relate to uh, dealing with the states, the states versus federalism, uh, are there more similarities than we may think, politics aside, just in terms of the bureaucracy and things? And, and why do you believe that the states are the laboratories where um, innovation can happen best? Well, that's a big question, Jeff. Sure. I'm just going to take a little bit of have, some time to unpack that. We we, okay, we've got 30 minutes right, left. Right. Fine. Or 15 if we're going to do questions. So, first of all, there is, a, there, was, there is a big difference in my experience between the Obama administration, the Trump administration, the Biden administration. The Biden, well, the Obama administration basically ignored us as states. They didn't talk to us at all. Like, I'm trying, I think Because maybe, you were a Republican, do you think? Or did you hear that from your I, uh, I don't colleagues? think it was because I was a Republican. I think it was just their general view of the states, that their administration was much more a top-down, centralized philosophy. I don't, I don't, I mean, go talk to a Democrat governor during the time frame and see what they think. Right. But. Um, I, I believe it was just their philosophy. Like, I think I maybe had one call from their liaison office and that was it. When we got to the Trump administration, it was a 180 degree turnaround. We had a lot of engagement. And now granted, we're certainly philosophically gonna be on the same, and policy-wise gonna be sure. on the same page. But we had a lot more interaction. The liaison office was much more responsive. And President Trump told his cabinet, be out of Washington, D.C. three days a week. So. You know, under the Obama administration, I don't think we saw a single cabinet member. Under the Trump administration, we had the Secretary of Agriculture in our state several times. We had this uh, EPA director there. We had transportation come in. I mean, we had numerous cabinet directors come to the state to talk about issues. And we had not seen that under Obama, and we still haven't seen it under the Biden administration. I would say the Biden administration has been better than the Obama administration, maybe because of the pandemic, and there's been more engagement with the states. So uh, I would say maybe, again, policy-wise, we're not on the same page, but I would say there's definitely people who have been more responsive or more engaged. Uh, Jeff Zients, who was their pandemic czar, was great. If I picked up a phone and wanted a phone call, I got a call back right away, which was the same response I got in the Trump administration when I wanted to talk to Ambassador Lighthizer, for example, or any of the other cabinet members. So Jeff has always been very responsive in getting back, and uh, Mitch Landrieu, who used, used to be the Lieutenant Governor of uh, Louisiana, is also a part of the thing. He's been very responsive as well, so. He's doing the infrastructure. Yeah, infrastructure program. stuff. So, so I think there's more engagement there. Um, probably, but we haven't seen cabinet members, so it's not been as good as the Trump administration, but I would say it's better than the Obama administration. If you look at, and then you, to your second part of your question about states, our founders set up a federalist system where the states created the federal government because they knew the states were all different. That states have different geography, they have different cultures, they have different desires, they have different needs. And so you want to be able to tailor 
whatever policy you have as close as possible to what those people want, right? You know, government is best when it's closest to the people. And, for example, when you're looking at emergencies, COVID pandemic, they are locally executed, state managed, and federally supported, right? Because every state's going to have a different approach or a different need, and that's why we manage emergencies that way. And that's the way it should be. The federal government should support the states in managing emergencies, but let us manage it, because we're going to know better than somebody in Washington, D.C. If you have a, a one-size-fit-all, cookie-cutter approach, you're just not going to be responsive. It's just not going to be as good outcomes as if you let people who are close to this, the system manage it. Now, does that mean some states will do a good job and some states will do a bad job? Yeah, that's what's going to happen. But ultimately, then the voters of that state can hold those elected officials accountable much more easily than somebody in Washington, D.C. So that's why I believe that it's important to allow states to be able to do what they're supposed to do under our Constitution as it was set up, right, the Tenth Amendment. Anything that's not specifically designated to the federal government is supposed to go to the states. Now, we've got away from that philosophy in a lot of ways, but I really think that's important for us to continue to try and fight for because I think it's important for us to allow states to try to not only manage emergencies, but to innovate, to try different things and see how they work. And frankly, the things that work in Nebraska may not work in New York and vice versa. And that's okay. There'll be different policies. That's okay if that's what the people of that state want. And we should allow that to happen. So I think it is important to allow states to be those laboratories of democracy. Was that uh, Justice Brandeis who mm -hmm. said that, right? I think so. So to be those laboratories of democracy and try different things, and some will fail, and some will be good, and some may be in, able to be used at the federal level. As uh, I mentioned earlier that you're chair of the Republican Governors Association. Co-chair. Co-chair. But you were chairman, I think, previously. I was morning. chair a few years ago, yeah. So you have a lot of interaction with other governors, and also there's the National Governors Association, so there is. Um, are there, uh, do you get, and take me behind the scenes there a little bit in your conversations with other governors. Do you have uh, some that you uh, reach out to a lot and, and throw ideas back and forth, or what uh, is going on in the ranks of governors? Because obviously it doesn't get as much national attention necessarily, but it's where a lot of the work is getting done in the state capitals. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would say among Republican governors especially, there's a great collegiality. And it, again, it's like any other relationship. You get out of it what you put into it. Right. Some governors really want to be involved. Some governors don't. And uh, for example, Kim Reynolds in Iowa, my next door neighbor, we're bouncing ideas off each other all the time, talking on the phone all the time, How you, especially during the pandemic. How are you approaching this? How are you approaching that? Uh, Doug Ducey of Arizona got elected the same time I did. He's a business guy. Same sort of deal when we got elected, we were, you know, we just naturally, because we had that affinity of business and we're trying to bring those types of operations to government, talked a lot and we've become great friends, you know, in, over the course of the last seven and a half years of our respective tenures. And so there are de definitely people you develop stronger relationships with. During the pandemic, we were having twice weekly calls with the Republican governors to talk about different ideas. You know, for example, I'll share one with you. Mike DeWine was doing uh, press conferences every day. I was only doing twice a week. I'm like, oh, that's a great idea. We should do that. So we, we didn't do them seven days a week. We did them five days a week. But I was doing five in English, two in Spanish all throughout the week. And it was absolutely critical to getting information out to people during the pandemic when there was so much uncertainty. So that's an example of how I, bar I borrowed an idea from Mike DeWine. Uh, both Doug Ducey in Arizona and Doug Bergam in North Dakota were doing a stay home, stay healthy, stay connected campaign. I totally ripped it off word for word, didn't give them any credit, and just used that in Nebraska. <laughs> so we steal each other's good ideas. And um, so there is, there's a lot of interaction back and forth to talk about what we're doing and how we can share ideas, especially during the pandemic when we're on phone calls twice a week. Frankly, it was also a little bit of a therapy session. <laughs> so, uh, but that also built a lot of collegiality. And then with regard to Democrat governors as well, um, you know, like Tim Walls in Minnesota is a great guy. His mom actually is from Nebraska. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. He always says, there, when he sees me, he's, Tim's, a, like I say, he's a great guy. He's like, he always sees me and goes, there's my mom's favorite governor. <laughs> <laughs> Where's she from in Nebraska? Valentine. Valentine, okay. Yeah. So. so from your point of view, after serving for almost eight years, the country does seem more divided uh, than a generation or so ago. What is your sense of optimism or pessimism for the next chapter in public life here, as there are questions about uh, fundamental truths in democracy and, uh, and things? What is your sense 
right now as you are on the cusp of uh, your final year in the governor's mansion? Well, first of all, for all you young people in the audience, if somebody old like me tries to tell you about the good old days, they're making that up. These are the good old days. Don't <laughs> let anybody kid you. Like, these are the good old days, okay? Like, all the great access to things that we have today in our country, these are the good old days. So, because of technology and things. Technology, that, I mean, that just, you couldn't have dreamed of when you were here as a student. No, or uh, just and just quality and, of life issues. I mean, you think about all the great things. Technology is one aspect right. of the quality of life, but you know, you think about. I'm just going to take. I'm kind of a foodie. Like in Omaha, when I was growing up, I had never been to a Chinese restaurant until one of my friends took me my senior year of high school, right? And now there's all sorts of great food options. I mean, just like, just like it's just a lot more like poke. That's an, an American invention. Invented in Hawaii. I love that <laughs> poke. We get it in Nebraska, for, for, you know, fish flown in fresh every day. So uh, that kind of stuff. So when so you, the world is smaller in a lot of respects. It is smaller in a lot of respects. Um, so and then just with regard to politics, I guess you know we've been through divisive times before, like the 1960s. Like man, we just got to hold on to get to the 1980s. The musical get better, all that sort of good stuff. So uh, 1980s, best music decade ever. Just so you know. <laughs> um, but so I, you know, like. It's always so. You're optimistic. I'm optimistic. It. Yes, I th I think this is a great country. There's great opportunities, and they're getting greater all the time. And yes, we have divisive periods. It's not new. People say, "Oh well, politics is like so divisive, and people are so angry at each other." I'm like, "Well, let's go back and look at our history, folks. Go back to the founders. Uh, a lot of those founders didn't really like each other, right? Alexander Hamilton, Aaron Burr got to a duel. One of them killed the other one. We don't <laughs> see that today, right?" At least politicians aren't killing themselves, but they wrote under, you know, uh, you know the name Publis, right, and wrote really personal attacks on each other. Thomas Jefferson started a whisper campaign against George Washington because he wanted Tom, Jefferson wanted to be president. He didn't want Washington to be there. And Washington called it on. Jefferson lied to his face about it. I mean, politics has always been kind of like that. So we just let's let's have a perspective on this and just remember we got a great country and we'll get through this. It's sometimes going to be painful. Uh, it's not going to happen fast, or at least at the rate we'd like to see it happen. But it's going to get better, and we'll continue to have a great country. One thing that is obviously different uh, is the is technology, like we talked about, and social media. In many respects, has unified people in their existing divisions. Um, what is your uh, thought on the estate of information versus disinformation? and how the citizens of this country and the state are informed and whatnot. Does that uh, concern you at all about the level of disinformation that is uh, in the country? Well, social media is a tool. And just like any tool, we have to learn how to handle it. Think about automobiles, right? Uh, decades ago, we had, not that we still don't have problems with drunk driving, but we had a much worse problem with drunk driving. Uh, people would drink and drive. That's a bad idea we had to learn to use the tool of the car by not drinking and driving. Now, again, it's never completely gone away, but it's better now than what it used to be. Uh, it used to be, frankly, it used to be socially acceptable to drink and drive, but now it's not. So that's an example of how we've had to learn a tool like the car to use it better by not drinking and driving. Social media is going to be the same way. We have to learn how to use it, right? You can't get all your news from social media I'm trying to keep you in business here, Jeff. Good. <laughs> Good. You know, right? So you, you just can't get your news from social media because it is not a professional journalist who's held to a standard of ethics and you know so forth. That's just not healthy. And so we've got to get we've got we've got to learn to use that tool. And just like with drunk driving and all, mothers against drunk driving and all the sorts of groups that went against that, we have to have people who are organizing to be able to help educate other people. We got to do a better job using the tools. It'll happen over time, and we've got to learn how to do it but we will get better at it. Uh, just in a couple of minutes, we'll take questions. So for those who have questions, uh, begin thinking of them and uh, get ready to line up. But I, I mentioned rugby at the very beginning of this. You played rugby. I played rugby no. here, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Were you good? No, not at no. all. <laughs> so I was that small was but slow. Future. Small but slow. Okay. I was, uh, B, I, I was a B team player, so I was, I was not the A squad. Once in a while, they, when not enough people showed up, I got to play on the A side, but mostly I played B team. But it was a ton of fun. I loved it. And I, played, I continued to play when I went back to Nebraska. So at the time when you were a student here, sitting in many of these same uh, seats, and then later in business school, uh, did you uh, 
think seriously or hope seriously that you would be in public service either as a senator or governor, or did that come later after some time in the business world? No, that came later after, uh, much later. I, I really, I, I mean, I always paid attention and uh, that sort of thing and voted, but I was not somebody who was aspiring to get into public service. It actually, and like many things, you have to ask people. I was asked to run for Senate back in 2000, I was asked in 2005 for the 2006 election, and that's what really got me seriously thinking about public service, and ultimately I decided to run uh, and got my tail handed to me, got beat pretty easily. You probably remember that race. I do. You ran against Ben Nelson, I think the last <laughs> Democrat elected statewide. Yeah, here's the thing. You don't know what you don't know sometimes. Didn't know running against a very popular incumbent was a hard thing to do. <laughs> my guess is you learned a lot from that experience. I'm sorry, what? My guess is you oh, learned yeah. a lot. Oh, yeah. You learn a lot more from your failures than you do your successes. That's for sure. So, but I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I loved the process, stayed involved behind the scenes, and then ultimately you know, ran for governor. What lesson would you impart on that to uh, students here in, in terms of learning from failures? Um, just about anything in life, or learning from maybe not getting that first job that you apply for. Yeah, I mean, I know it's, it's very trite, but you do learn a lot more from your failures than your successes, and failures can be the springboard to your next success, and you just have to, you know, it's okay to fail. In fact, actually, when I interview people, I always ask them, tell me about a time you failed. And if they can't tell me about a time they failed, I know they're not trying very hard. Because if you try to push the envelope, if you're taking a risk, by definition, risk means sometimes there's a chance that it's going to turn out poorly. And if you take enough risk, at some point it will turn out poorly, right? You're not going to bat a thousand. And that's okay. It's okay to fail. Try to make sure you're putting things in place so the failure isn't catastrophic, right? But if you can recover from your failure, you're going to be better the next time around. And so if you can't tell me about a failure, you're not trying hard enough. You're not pushing the envelope. You're not taking risks. I want to have people in my organization that are willing to take risks. They're willing to push the edge because that's how you make progress. So you can't make progress without failure, I guess is what I'd say, and just don't make the same mistake twice. So do most people have an answer to that, or does that rattle some people? I will tell you, there's a fair number of people say, well, The secret's out failed. now, so anyone applying yeah. for a job. Yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> right. No, no, now it's all live stream. It's going to be out there. Right. But you'll be surprised how many people come for an interview and don't actually do the research. So. Right. Yeah. Okay, great. Who has questions for uh, Governor Pete Ricketts? Step behind the microphone if uh, anyone does. I know you all. First one's always the hardest. There we go, sir. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? We yeah. can. I'm Zach. I'm a fellow Boothie getting a dual master's at the Harris School of Public Policy. And I've got two questions. The first one is. Wait, is that fair? You get to ask two? Sure. Why not? No. <laughs> the first one. The second one's about the Cubs. The first one is I'd just like to hear some of the things you're most proud of as governor. And the second one, I'd like to know uh, why the Cubs can't be competitive every year like the Yankees and Dodgers through <laughs> spending. Totally understand if you don't hey, want to. That's a different them. brother. That's a different brother. Okay. All right. So uh, for the first one, I got to tell you, first of all, I'm, I'm very proud of our team because they do a wonderful job. They, I would put my cabinet up against anybody else in the country. We've got so many talented individuals who are working very hard on behalf of the people of Nebraska. And what that team has been able to do is really improve how we provide services to the people of Nebraska. Uh, I mentioned earlier, just we talked about mental health and our system of care and some of the innovative things we've done there. Uh, U.S. News & World Report ranks Nebraska the third best state for mental health. Uh, we have, one of the key things I did when I came into office is implement Lean Six Sigma, which is a process improvement methodology to providing, doing a better job providing our services. And I'll give you a, just kind of a quick example. Um, SNAP, the supplemental, supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, or otherwise known as food stamps, is how we help out families who need our help, right? Food assistance. In August of 20. 14, so before I got elected, it was taking us nearly 23 minutes to answer the phone when somebody called into our economic assistance line. What does that say about us as a state? If we're, and I, again, if you're waiting 23 minutes on average, I mean, some people wait a lot longer. What does that say, to, what does it say to us about us as a state, what we think about you as a customer, if we're making you on, wait on hold 23 minutes? It was taking us 40 days to process a SNAP application. So here's a family who needs food assistance and we're taking more than a month to get back to them? That's terrible service. Those families need that help a lot faster. So what is it now? So what we did is we set a goal, five minutes or less in the customer service line, or in the, SNAP, the economic assistance line, 10 days to process the SNAP application, and we, we started making process improvement changes. 
And for nearly four years, we actually were under the five minutes and the 10 days, and then the pandemic came along and demand surged and we had to adapt, adapt and adjust. Uh, it's one of the things I've been really harping on our folks. We, we finally, uh, well, we went for about a year, we were out of compliance with both those measurements, but we got it down. Last week, we were about three, dollar, or three minutes and 19 seconds in our customer service line. And uh, we're down to about 12 days, 12 to 13 days processing SNAP applications, so we're not quite there yet. But the point is we set measurements and we know if we're doing it or not, and then we can put more resources or focus on getting that service level back up to where it needs to be. And that's one of the things we've done. We've really done a great job of providing that. Uh, uh, and just by doing a better job of how we do things, whether it's you know, taking care of folks in our economic assistance line or our pandemic response, uh, Politico, you know, not exactly a conservative news outlet, mm -hmm. ranked Nebraska the number one pandemic response state. Mm -hmm. And that's helped us with our recovery. And so Nebraska has the lowest unemployment rate, not only in state history, but the history of the United States, tied with Utah. And the NE Casey Foundation ranks Nebraska the second best state overall for children's economic well-being. And our overall ranking has improved from 12 to 9 to 7 over the last three years. So again, we, we look at outside benchmarks to see how we're doing, but we focus on how we can provide service. And that's one of the things I'm most proud of is we, we're doing a better job serving people, and we can show it through the metrics that we're doing a better job. And with regard to the Cubs, <laughs> I think, look, I know when you say the Yankees are competitive every year. Are they really competitive every year? Sometimes they have off years. They're like second or third. Um, you know what? Every, you got to bring up those young players occasionally. So every few years, you're going to be trying to bring up young players. And that's an art as much as it is a science. And so we're going to look to be more competitive. Every, we'd love to be more competitive every year. We were competitive. Look, hey, come on. We, we won a World Series. We were in the playoffs a lot. Uh, but we do have to get back to that level, but it's going to take a few more years as we bring up some more of those young players. But, yeah, that is my brother Tom that's running the team. I, I'm state of Nebraska. He's running the Chicago Cubs. Not to d ditch it on too much, but, yeah, it's him. Okay, Declan. Governor, thanks uh, for taking the question from me. Uh, so in 1913, we passed the 17th Amendment, which says that uh, the people of the states and not state legislatures choose U.S. senators. Uh, and clearly, since 1913, we've seen basically a total capitulation of state power to the national government. Would you favor a repeal of the 17th Amendment to return power to the sovereign states? Thank you. Well, Declan, that's a great question. It's a very philosophical question. I have not given it that much thought. I would say our founders decided to have legislatures pick the senators for a reason. And I think you draw a good analogy between the loss of state sovereignty and that, though, I'm, I think the big change came with the Great Depression, not necessarily 1913. So prior to the Great Depression, most of the spending in this country was done at the state level. With the Great Depression and all the programs we put in place at that time, the federal government started spending more money in the states, and it's been continuing that trend ever since. So I'm not sure it's as direct a correlation as that. But I think it, so I'm not willing to make a commitment on it right now, Declan, but I think it's actually a great question to think about because we ought to go back and say, what did the founders have in mind when they were doing that, and was that a good idea? Because there's certainly a natural human behavior that if I'm elected by the people, I've got to go to Washington, D.C. and bring something back for the people to continue to elect me. And so there may be that tendency of senators to then continue to maybe not be the balance to the House with regard to spending, but try to spend more money so they can, they can claim something to bring back to their constituents. But is definitely worth spending more time on. Sir. Hello, Governor. Thank you for being here. My name is Cameron Landon. I'm a first-year undergrad. Um, Y'all were speaking earlier about the unicameral legislator in Nebraska. So do you believe that this is a more efficient system of government than the bicameral legislator? And has it led to increased bipartisanship? Uh, the answer to the first part, no, it is absolutely not more efficient. <laughs> it takes longer to do everything. So in our system, so maybe step back for everybody. We have a one-house system of unicameral. And it is uh, officially nonpartisan. And so when the, we call them state senators, run for office, they run without party affiliation. So you can have districts where there's two Republicans running against each other, two Democrats running against each other, and so forth. In the primary system, it's the top two vote getters go on to the general election. And that's how you can end up either two Republicans or two Democrats running against each other. But we also have a filibuster rule, which means that if you can hold 17 of our 49 votes, you can block any bill. 
And so it actually is not as efficient from the standpoint of how quickly you pass bills. Now, I'm not saying that's necessarily a bad thing, right? Our founders set up the House and Senate at the federal level to, and they wanted the Senate to be a deliberative body to slow things down for a reason, that they wanted government to be deliberative, they wanted it to be slow moving with regard to policy changes. They didn't want this whipsaw back and forth between different policy changes because they knew that was bad for the country. So, uh, so when I say it's not as efficient, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Um, like any system, it's got its pros and cons. I've not worked in other legislatures around the country, so I'm only basing this on what other people tell me. I do think that our unicameral is less partisan, based on what I'm told, than other state houses where you've got Republicans and Democrats. So there's trade-offs either way. And, you know, I will, you know, for example, there's no automatic voting block to go to when you want to pass legislation, which is, again, one of the reasons why it takes longer. Again, not necessarily a bad thing. You know, it's bad when I it's not, it's bad, it's bad when it's slow for my legislation, but good when it's somebody else's bad legislation, right? I'm glad it goes slow <laughs> for them. So, um, so, but it's just, you know, you, so you got to go build a coalition every time you want to pass a bill. So that can make it longer to do it. But there's only 49 senators who can get to know people. Uh, you know, we passed, uh, you know, the largest tax relief package in Nebraska history this past session, uh, 12 times larger than any previous tax relief package in any administration. I think it passed with 41 out of 49 votes, which means a bunch of Democrats voted for it. So you can, and it, but it took, well, I've been trying to pass a package like that since my first year, so it took a long time to get there, but we got to a point where we got it to be a bipartisan bill. So like I said, pros and cons to every system. It's the system I'm working with, so that's the one I, I work with. Sir. Hi, Governor. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Chris. I'm a first year in the college. Uh, you're a Catholic, and you're a member of the Knights of Columbus. I'm a Catholic myself, I'm pretty devout, and I have seen firsthand how churches can be a huge vehicle to help people find community, and through that, internal peace. Uh, what role do you feel places of worship have in community building uh, in order to prevent terrible tragedies that are thought to result from widespread social isolation like drug overdoses and in the case we were talking about, mass shootings? Yeah, absolutely. I, I do think that houses of worship have a huge role to play in that. That's one of the reasons why in Nebraska during the pandemic, we didn't shut down houses of worship. We asked them to put restrictions in place with regard to how many people they had and so forth, but we didn't want to shut it down completely. And some found really creative ways of having services, like having everybody in their car and stuff like that, you know, doing it outside in a car. So, I, but I think that's important because I think they're an important part of the, the fabric of civil society. And houses of worship can do a lot of good. Uh, we see this from, you know, all sorts of denominations where they get involved to do the mission of their religion to be able to help people. So I think it's absolutely critical. And I'll, I'll say something more. I think it's not only good for the people in your community, but it is vital to our republic. Our founders absolutely believed that we had to have our moral religious values to run our country. They absolutely believe that. Usually when I prepare to do like a religious freedom thing, I'll get a quote from like George Washington who talked about this sort of thing or one of the other founders. But they absolutely believed it because, and I'll, I'll share a quick story with you. Does anybody know who Clayton Christensen is? He was a Harvard Business School professor passed away a couple years ago. He wrote a book called The Innovator's Dilemma. Great book if, you, if you're interested in business. It was written like 25 years ago. You should still pick it up, still valuable. It's how small companies with technology come and disrupt big companies. But the story this is about is he, he's a Harvard Business School professor, and there's a Chinese professor in the uh, country studying our system. And the professor was just getting ready to go back to China, and so Clayton Christensen had him over to his house for dinner and said, what is the most surprising thing you learned about our country? And this Chinese professor said, how important your religious values are in the functioning of your government, because people will do the right thing even when nobody's looking. And by the way, you're losing it. So here was an outside observer who had no ax to grind that I know of that observed how important those foundational moral principles are to running our government because it involves us doing the right thing even when nobody's watching us. And I do think that is one of the things that House of Worship reinforce is that higher purpose that not, it's not about you, it's about others and serving that higher purpose. Uh, hello, Governor. Thank you for coming and speaking to us today. I know we're all glad to have you here. 
My name is Jack Moore. Uh, I am a second year at the college. I am majoring in business economics and American history, preferably. Uh, my question to you is about mental health and social media and its role in society today. You very clearly take pride in your state's role in addressing mental health. Uh, what do you think that the state has a role in, in dealing with social media? And if you think it does have a role in general, what do you think they should do in order to prevent things like these tragedies that could be happening, or, uh, getting on message boards that promote radical ideas, or just generally causing depression or anxiety in things like young girls? Yeah, I think the role of the state is not to try to suppress speech, but to help do the education on people on, again, as social media is a tool, like any tool can be used well or poorly, and we, so the state can have a role of helping teach people to use it well, you know, use it appropriately. Help parents teach their kids how they should do, you know, how they should monitor social media and how their, you know, how their kids should use social media as an example. Uh, there's other things I described earlier with regard to what the state can do to help promote mental health care in our state to be able to help the folks who you know, need our services. But I think when it comes specifically to social media, it, for us it's about trying to educate people. It's about trying to support the nonprofits that are out there. They're trying to educate people about the dangers of social media and about how to handle it and use it as a tool, you know, that sort of thing. So I think that's the role of the state. I don't know that the state has a role in trying to say um, outside, you know, kind of the normal course of business of things we do to be able to shut down people who are, uh, you know, trying to plan, you know, terrorist attacks and things like that. The state has a role, obviously, there, but I mean, just as the state of Nebraska, I think our role is more about trying to help educate the public generally about how they can use these tools so that they don't fall into the trap of spending too much time on it and letting it become depressing and that sort of thing. We're getting the sign that uh, we're, we're 44 we're gonna seconds this, over. Right, so we're going right. to make this the lightning yeah. around here. If you right. ask a very fast question, oh, I know. We'll we give a fast, and fast I'm supposed to give a fast answer, right? Now, that's yeah. the problem here. Farmer, master's student. I just like politics, even though I'm a math kid. Um, a lot, there are a lot of counties in especially western Nebraska that appear to be losing population despite the state gaining population as a whole. And with these losses in population can come dilapidated communities, which in turn could breed the mental health effects that you talked about earlier. So I guess how do you address you know, depopulation that appears to be occurring throughout the western part of the state? Yeah, I think one of the things we have to remember is that technology impacts everything, including agriculture, which means agriculture has become more efficient with regard to leveraging technology to be able to do more with less, right? So how do we combat that? That there just are, there's, there's going, I mean, there's just a trend, there's, there's fewer farmers and ranchers, which means there's fewer people is the, kind of the base of that economy. One of the key things I think we have to do is make sure we have broadband all across our state. I think it's similar to rural electrification or rural telephone. The, the state government has to have a role in here because the private sector won't do it because it's too expensive. So we have to be involved directly, and that's what we're doing at the state of Nebraska. We're investing tens of millions. Actually, we're going to have, by the time we get said and done, it's going to be over a billion dollars in making sure every household in Nebraska has that high speed internet connection. I'm talking about 100 gigabit download, 100 gigabit, meg, uh, megabit upload, so that you can start your business and run it there, have the same quality of life, that sort of thing. And as far as just in general in rural communities, it's about making sure that we have the quality of life, access to health care, shopping, I said broadband that'll help, all those sort of things. And then we need to go out and sell the great quality of life that you have in rural Nebraska. I mean, it is a great quality of life. It's different from Chicago, but it's a great quality of life. Thanks. Okay, final one. Um, first and foremost, I want to say thank you for coming all the way here. It was an absolute pleasure to hear all your insights about today's topics. Um, I'm Perry Zhao. I'm a second-year undergrad studying econ and philosophy in the college. Um, outside of my academics, I serve as a research intern at the Illinois Policy Institute, currently working on projects to increase accountability of governments at state and local levels. Um, one key principle I know you mentioned in this event was on restoring the power to localized governments, and that reminded me of our governor, J.B. Pritzker. Um, I'm an Illinoisan. Um, as I'm sure you're aware, Pritzker recently extended, extended his emergency powers for the 29th time, marking over 800 days of maintaining essentially autonomous rule over our state's COVID policy. Uh, this is pretty contrary to Nebraska, where I think handling has landed much lower unemployment rates, uh, growing populations, some from Illinois, and a booming post-pandemic economy. Um, just from your gubernatorial experience, how should we, like as Illinoisans, for example, ensure the accountability of a politically monolithic state government that seeks to impose socially and restrictive policies? Well, at the end of the day, right, the founders gave us the tools, and that's called elections. 
and that means people need to get involved. Uh, we've got many issues in Nebraska uh, that have become controversial over the last couple of years. And people come to me and say, hey, how can it stop it? And I say the first thing is like, well, we needed you involved 10 years ago because you need to be involved then to be able to help make sure the people you elect are the ones making those policy decisions for you. So you have to get involved. If you don't like what your school board's doing, you gotta go to the school board meeting. I, I travel to my state all the time, I do town halls. Property tax was a big issue for us. And so people would complain about their property taxes. I'm like, well, did you go to the school board meeting when they talked about the budget? You know, you try to change a mascot at a school, you'll fill up an auditorium. <laughs> but go to a school board meeting when they're talking about the budget, it's crickets, right? If you're not happy with the government, you have to get involved. That's what our founders left us in this great republic. You, you don't like, that's, that's what we're supposed to be doing. If you don't like what they're doing, well, there's going to be an election come up. If you don't like the school board, throw them out. If you don't like your state senator, throw them out. If you don't like the governor, throw them out. I mean, that's, that's what elections are supposed to be about. And in the meantime, you can organize, you can go write letters or go visit, you know, go talk to your representative elected, your elected representatives, share with your opinions, all that sort of thing. Try to get more people on your side. I mean, it's, it's, it's why we have elections, though, is if you don't like what the person's doing, you got to hold them accountable, accountable at the ballot box. Thank you all very much for the questions, uh, both here in person, and thank you for watching online. Governor, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you for taking you, the time. And, uh, yeah. Good luck in Great. the rest of your time. Thank you very much.